made you operate better. It made you, at the end of the day, I, I, I think more profitable. Now, you'll, you'll talk to that. But I think that comment really resonated with me because there's other dealers in this room that have experienced that same kind of thing. They're better because of Costco. And, and, and I know your story is today, and I'm going to put words in your mouth, but I think as a network, we're better because of Costco, because it's forced us to do things at a different point. So one of our most successful Costco dealers, and it's got a good story to tell. So let's welcome Rob Crispin. Super. All right, well, thank you, sure. Mr. Walker. Um, it is true, I mean, basically, uh, Costco has changed how we do business, um, per se. We um, have been selling in different fashions under the EcoWater brand for many years, decades, in fact. Um, have always enjoyed pretty good success until the economy went kind of south in 2007, and we pulled out of it a little bit, didn't do much with the sales program until about 2014, um, so a little bit of a gap there. But um, what it transpired was um, we've been in the Costco program for a while. We weren't doing much with it. It was just kind of sitting idle. And um, I will refer to a letter or email that uh, was written in April 1st of 2014 um, that came from Rick. And it was very simple. It was um, if you weren't selling X amount of product and your average to the Costco stores wasn't 3,000. Um, if you weren't following certain guidelines, weren't doing water demos, etc., like that, then you need to reevaluate because you weren't going to basically be in the program anymore. Well, those are kind of hard hitting because if you, if you looked at the Costco program, there was a lot of opportunity there at the time. At least it appeared to, to me. So, um, I took that to heart myself and you know, tried to do something different in our company. So what, what I did is I looked at the pureness of um, the statement that was made. And the first thing I did was I went to this presentation that was listed there. I realized that a lot of dealers haven't really even looked at it or used it or anything of that nature. But, but I did. So I'm just going to tell you about my story as it transpired. Um, I looked at the presentation because I had just been back selling for about oh, two weeks and faced a lot of failure. I'd seen a lot of Costco members. I didn't know what to say to them. Didn't know what to do. So I opened the presentation the first time I looked at it, had an appointment in about 30 minutes, and I left uh, the house, presentation in hand, went into somebody's house. It was one of those appointments where you just, you, there's nothing you can do. Okay, the lady, um, had her husband inside, he was doing homeschool with the kids. So I was taken to the garage where I could present selling a water softener. So I opened the presentation and I went through it, page by page, first 25 pages, and made up a story every single page when I went by. Okay? So as I went through, I'm going to flip through them today with you guys, just to um, kind of go through it. What kind of I remember I said those days, you know, so um, there wasn't much to it, but I simply opened that, you know, what the major water roles were. Only 1% of our water is um, drinking water quality. The rest of it, you know, we filter through the city to create quality of 1%, which isn't that great. Went to um, Warren Buffett, and I said, Warren Buffett's a great guy. You may not like him. You may hate him. Um, personally, I don't care, but Costco loves the guy. You've got deep pockets, you can back anything that's going to happen out there. I was just trying to create credibility as I went. As I moved on, I said, worldwide company, all over the world, but be happy the products you buy from us are getting made in Mississippi or Minnesota, so it's a USA product. Simple stuff, a dealer, told a little bit about a dealer, just adding credibility to it. Continued protection, consumers need protection, Costco's done the research. They like you to see this page. You're protected. Moving through, I talked about their water, how, how it affects them, what we're going to do for them. In our case, we're going to take care of the chlorine that makes your water taste bad, gives you bad odor. We're going to take care of the hardness that makes your water hard to use. 
Basically, we're going to take care of three things. Total dissolved solids, chemicals like chlorine, and hardness. That's what our product does, and that's what we do for you. As I moved on, I talked a little bit about this. I got into basically things that I already knew. A water heater will gain five pounds a year. So in 15 years, you got an additional 75 pounds of uh, calcium. It weighs as much as the water heater did brand new. Um, energy factors would go up to 50% more to heat your water during that period of time. Shower head can clog in 30 days at 30 grains of hardness. Your water's not that hard, but you probably won't let it run for 24 hours a day. So just skipping through all of our water where we are is over 10 and a half grains. So you're outside the box. Um, costs, went through the cost a little bit. Went through our regeneration because the platform we use is the refiner, how it works, why it works, lifetime warranty, good news, Costco you know, is part of it. Your warranties through them, through us, and Warren backs it. So just try to create the credibility as I went. Um, I have a little extra page about chlorine out, it degrades resin. Talked a lot about chlorine, cost, etc. Here's where I would do water tests. I would introduce the you know, washing the hands, um, soap tests, precip tests, whatever I needed to do at this point to keep people involved in the presentation. How it feels on your skin. Um, got that out of the way. Um, clothes, crunchy clothes, if you hang them up on the line, they're hard as a rock. Uh, what it costs them, soaps, etc. As I move forward, I ended up on this page where I told my story. The only reason I go through that with you is because I didn't have a plan before I got the presentation. It created me a roadmap to get from point A to a point where I could do something with the customer. As I learned at my first, my first one, of course I didn't sell it in the garage with the one lady that was husband in the house, but I followed up much like the CentOff program. I did my callbacks, I did them in the first 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. The moral of that story is that lady finally bought after six months, mm. was just strictly following up. My second two, not so good, crashed and burned, so zero for three. <laughs> I hit the fourth one, I remember I was there for four hours, um, grinding, grinding, grinding. He finally signed up. I would have never got there without the presentation at that time. My next eight presentations sold all eight, okay? Um, they got quicker, faster, more efficient as they went on. Without that success, I probably would have thrown it in the trash. Okay, but with success, we learned. What it taught me was, as I watched the customers and learned the presentation, I was no longer, I already knew the story. And I could watch their eyes, I could see the reaction. I realized the customers reacted to certain pages. They reacted to certain things I said. Because I was saying the same thing over and over and over. Repetition, repetition, repetition. It allowed me to learn where the key points were, what they were responding to, and so forth. Now, I did this because I wanted to train other people to do it. So it was very regimented, very, I wanted it to be simple. When I opened my presentation, I'd say, I can answer any question you may have today. However, to be fair with you, we have Costco's 50 states, dealers all over the country. This presentation is made for all dealers. I'm going to show that to you. Whatever questions it doesn't answer, I can handle them. I'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. And people accepted that. When I got to the end, everybody said they had no questions. Maybe because they didn't want to go any longer. Who knows? However, it worked. Because normally, I'm fending off questions from the minute I walk in the door. And I don't know what those questions are coming from. They could come from my competition. Um, they have control of me. I have complete control of the customer when I'm working off of a presentation. So as I learned, I, I immediately started to train after about two months some green peas. No education in the water business whatsoever. Well, they had a hard time learning, so I printed at the bottom of every page exactly what to say. Now the customer could read that as well. And I felt it was really like training wheels, but maybe not a good program, but as I trained with the training wheels on, I noticed customers reading every line. I noticed the salespeople reading every line while I was talking. It was easy to gauge what they were doing because they weren't even looking at me. However, if I missed a sentence, a statement, they would bring it up. They'd say, well, you missed this part. I was like, wow, this is really strange. 
But those people were buying too, even the ones who were reading the script with them. So the salespeople I trained never took off the script because it was right there for them. Told them exactly how to write up a deal. Your product code, price you're gonna put in, your installation charge, everything was detailed. There was no imagination. What I learned was customers like clarity, transparency. They don't like surprises. They don't trust it when we give a number that's not right up front, written, whatever the case may be. And it was like, we were learning all the time, you know, how to hit points, triggers, that uh, made the consumer more comfortable with dealing with us. So this transpired over about a six month period of time with myself and people who had never been in the business. Of course, we had a few salesmen that had been around, they weren't gonna touch this stuff. There was no way to make it work. So with time, the new people did better than the older people. We moved some of those out, they didn't sell for us anymore. We hired a couple of veterans, which our very first veteran was very good. I mean, he had real experience. He was the number one salesman in the country for another brand. And he was like, presentation, what is that? You know, what am I gonna do with that? And he follows the whole 25 pages even to today and loves it. And his comments to me are, I like it. I don't feel like I have to ever lie to a customer. If I do, I can go home. It's like, it's all there, I can't. It's, I just present, they purchase, but I can go to work on them after the presentation. I could still be a salesperson at the end. But our presentations today are all by first 25 pages. And it's by desperation on our part to not lose the Costco program. At that time, we did about 1,500 per location per week. Everybody knows what that means pretty much. Um, within three months, we were over 3,000. Within a year, we were hitting five and $6,000 a week per store. Um, so I do believe in the program like that. With the same number of leads, just to give it some context. So yeah, you we, went we from- Yeah, we the stores more. Right, right. Same amount of stores. We've been in the program three years, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. we've been talking today about four years. I mean, our, our, our sheet says we've been a dealer since 2010 in Costco, so I don't really know what that means. So, um, I don't know. The numbers don't go back that far. Okay. Nobody in was in there in 2020. However, we were never <laughs> very strong at it in the whole the first two or three years we were in the program. Our salesmen hated the lead in the beginning. They didn't want anything to do with the Costco lead. They thought they were terrible to run. You know, so there was a, a whole thing. Salesmen didn't like the lead. They thought it was much better to go out on a different kind of lead than a Costco lead. Now today, it, it's hard for me to get, get a guy to run a non-Costco lead. You don't want anything to do with it. Um, like, why are you sending out customers to call it? I don't want that. I'm going to have a hard time selling it. You know, so it's just a matter of We're mental, almost there too. mental side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's changing. That does change too. But, but in our case, it was a big change of direction. It helped us immensely. Um, I don't know how everybody else in the room does this. I don't know if you use presentations. I don't know if you have a plan when you go into a house. I don't know if you just answer questions. Um, but when we stopped answering questions and gave the customer a presentation, just a roadmap, um, it seemed to work. It, it's amazing, too, because I would explain on the uh, resin page why water softeners break. Because the chlorine degradates them, they're gone in five years. They just blow up. Resin turns to mush in our area. And we live with three parts per million of chlorine every day. So. And the customer, I already knew the customer had a broken water softener when I walked in the door. When I walked in the door, I said, come, let me show you the water softener that's broken. I said, nope, nope, don't need to. It's not what I do. Let's go through the presentation first. Be happy to look at it later. When I get to the other presentation, I go, what about your old water softener? They go, nope, nope, you told me why it's broken. I understand. And I love hearing that from a customer because now I don't get in a position where I have to talk about another competitor. I don't have to talk about the product. I don't have to verify that it works or doesn't. They told me it doesn't. They told me why it doesn't based on my information. But I'm not telling them based on a question. When you don't, if you don't have to answer a question, you're much better off if they come to their own conclusion before you can answer it by presentation. So those are some of my thoughts on that. Um, and that's really pretty much our story. So we've expanded on it over the last two years almost. It's almost been two years since we made a major commitment to be in the Costco program. Um, I'm very happy we did. 
I think it's a great opportunity. It's a great league. I think there's a tremendous amount we could do more with it. Um, we find that we sell about 50% of the Costco appointments we go on. Um, we averaged, I think, 45% last year, closing ratio. And to be honest with you, we're not all first time close. We're about, we're running right about 32% are callbacks. And we're talking about high dollar callback. And you wouldn't, I didn't conceive that possible, but the consumer is armed with enough information, they do the research, and they call back. We do a great follow-up program. We do our proposals and we do all the steps that are involved. Um, we email all of our proposals from the office so we have complete control. There's no, there's no second guessing, they're all recorded just like they would be in the CentOff program if we were operating within it with every customer. We've created a system that mirrors CentOff, line by line, every callback, every follow-up, every proposal goes out, all office generated. And that's probably where our callbacks come from because we, we design it for the salesman to perform for a three hour window. They don't know the customer, they've never talked to the customer before they knock on that door. When they leave, they have no more contact with the customer if that makes any sense to everybody here. So our office controls the entire appointment from start to finish. The salesman only performs for a presentation period. We, don't, we do that so we don't lose the member or the customer. Um, we make sure that everybody gets the same treatment every single time. And that's what we base that program on. We couldn't do it without a presentation. We couldn't do it without the office as a support cast to make those things happen. And uh, so that's kind of my, my you know, introduction to where, how we got here, what we do today. So any questions or feedback? Go ahead. Do they, who does the follow-up? Does the salesperson do the follow-up? No. They don't. We set the follow-up exactly like it is in CentOff. We pick a date. I would love to pick the time, just like that they asked us to in the original CentOff program. Um, however, the times are really tough to meet. But we have a list that shows up every day, and we look at the follow-up as just as important as showing up for an appointment to happen that day. Is that was that generated at, at the sale? So the salesperson said, "What day and time do you want us to follow up with you?" Absolutely. Okay, and then how, so you have a different individual actually trying to engage that same customer. Uh, does the salesperson take any specific notes, like? You know, they, they they, they're, they're big dog them. lovers. They're buying it because they want to clean water for their dogs. Nothing. Do they? Well, they'll do the notes, but we also work off of a um, an app um, in the home. Uh huh. So our reps will fill out what the hardness is, what the TDS is. Um, I don't have it up on my screen. However, I can get past this microphone. I'll show you how easy it really simply is. Um, it's on phones, it's on pretty much everything we do. Um, did you find that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but did, did you find that the salespeople just simply weren't doing the follow-ups? Salesmen so never follow up. I mean, they do, I but know. they're gonna lie to you half the time and say they don't follow up. You know, they're not gonna do it when they're supposed to. They're gonna disappoint the customer every time when it counts, because I, yeah. I don't know a salesman yet they can tell me a beep, that there's somebody's going to buy, and they're right. And when they tell me they're not going to buy, that's the customer that calls back in. But they don't follow up with that one because they've already assumed they're not going to buy. You know, so it's, it's it's a great idea. I mean, I applaud you for it because well, we we wrestle with salespeople all the time, and you know when they are still closing forty percent, and yet not following up on on the sixty, you know you're sort of like, well, I'm glad I got the forty, well, but I this is a great idea. Well. This is a simple app. It, it basically, when we put in the customer number, it comes out of our appointment system. It fills in a name, address, everything that's in the system. The second thing it does is we go through and we fill out the hardness, if it's a loop. Because yeah. salesmen never remember if they have a loop or a full line when they go back. So we have them fill in the data before they ever even present what the data is at the home. Then we have them go outside and we take pictures and attach it to the file. So they can at least look at a picture and remember the house. 
Yeah. I would love to them to just take a picture of the customers so they can remember their face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the name of the actual app you're using? We built it ourselves. It's a self-made. It, we had a company build it for us. Um, but it it's got a, you know it works for what we, we do in our you know our company. But it's it's not hard. But it's we attached to. We built an app too. Our own, a good idea if you want, like Salesforce, but we also it's built that too. We, it's not anything you get on the, on the market. It's all self-built inside our company. So we have our appointment system is is, is off of Smartsheet. If anybody's ever heard of it, um, but the whole platform is based in Smartsheet, and the apps are all attached to Smartsheet and built on that platform. So you you're not gonna find it anywhere we have, but it's not hard to duplicate Salesforce probably in a CRM. Um, but by having, if it's a loop, all the factors. Um, then they go to a product. They just pick the product they're going to sell. It automatically hits the price. There's no price differential ever in our product. We have five choices on installation charge. So we got our variance there. We can go higher and actually negotiate the installation a little bit. You know, um, as you know, that's our money. That's what we get paid to do our service. So therefore, the customer makes us believe we should charge them a little less because it's a little easier than the last guys. We'll negotiate $100, $200 off the installation. But it's pretty regimented. I can tell exactly based on price what the installation charge the product, what product it is, everything by just seeing a price on ours. Um, that gives us real consistency. It meets the criteria of what Costco's looking for. Um, it gives the salesperson some flexibility. But in the beginning, salesmen always want to negotiate. I don't ever have any negotiation today. Nobody even calls, makes a call with the request. It's just one price fits all. Boom, you know, you're in a higher product, lower product, higher installation, lower installation. And people respect that. They go, they they don't argue the price with us anymore. It's a given. And it's probably the it's confidence with which we deliver it without the option to be able they can't go anywhere with the price. It's pick a model number, price just pops up right on the screen. Um, we hit the with the amount in, it shows the Costco cash card. It shows the executive amount. So when we're all done with that, presenting to the customer, we have three choices. You're either gonna place an order today, we're gonna to schedule a follow-up with an exact date, or we're gonna just put a red dot on you and you're, you're gone. You're not interested in the product. We sell for, you're not interested. Our whole presentation is, are you, if you're not interested, please tell me we're not gonna go any farther. We're not gonna schedule a follow-up because that's a lot of work for us. It's a lot of work for you because we're going to follow up that day. So if you change your phone number, we're going to knock on your door. We're going to find, you know, we're going to make sure we follow up with you because that's our commitment. Costco wants us to follow up. We have to follow up, and we get that commitment that people sell us on the follow up. If they sell us on the follow up, if they go get their calendar and they look, I'm off this day. I'll answer the phone. Emphasis is. We will contact you that day. Is this the best day? Just like setting an appointment to show up at their house. It's just as critical for us on the follow-up. Once we've set that follow-up, and it's a hard set, and they've talked us out of not following up, we try to talk them into it. Let's not follow up because we don't want to bother you. Just go ahead and tell me you don't want it. Yeah, I'm, you're not going to hurt my feelings because if I'm going to follow up, i got to put you in my system, and that's work. So once they've committed that they want the follow-up, we do immediately go to, if he wants to follow up in a week, we can schedule the order, and why are we waiting? So we do go into the sales role at that time. But we already committed the person on the follow up. Once they won't place the order, we go back to, are you sure you don't want a no follow up? We sell it back and forth very hard. We spend a lot of time going back and forth just on those three subjects. And what it boils down to is, we have a very committed follow up customer and probably why we get as many callbacks as we do. We have a couple other things we do in there, but to entice them not to be the, the follow-up, be the order. But those are things that we just do. Um, there's nothing about price drops, anything like that that we do. It's just we do have a very small incentive for them to do that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not asking for any numbers or anything, but if on your follow-ups, it's no longer your salesman that was at the house. Good doing that follow-up, what happens if they then purchase, how does it, does that affect your salesman? No, no, it's all geared for the salesperson. Okay. We're just going to do the job for them. So 
After we've established follow-up, we're going to put a date in. If it's an order, we're going to put an installation date. So we got three things. Once we've done that, we submit that order to the office, either an order for installation or an order for a follow-up. The follow-up creates a proposal. It's the same numbers that they've just seen. The office checks the numbers and immediately forwards that to the customer. The sales rep can be still sitting in the house. They can go over it together on the computer. We don't leave anything in the house when we leave. We send a proposal. Now, we know that the member has their proposal. We have an exact follow-up date. So when that follow-up date comes, we follow up and we ask, you've got your follow-up date, we're scheduled to follow up with you today. I work in the office, is there anything I can do to help you today? Are you ready? You know, for, for, What can I do? If they want to place an order, it's really easy. We reschedule another appointment for the rep to go back out. So he just gets an appointment just like he did before. It's just checked off as a go back, call back sale. It's not a fresh appointment. So now he's back in the same role. He's just going out on another appointment, but he knows he's going to go right business. He's got all the documentation what he left behind. He should have his pictures. He should have everything he needs. He's just facilitating paperwork. So his job's going to be easy, but he's still blocked for a three hour window. We use that in our selling of the, of the to go to an order because we do tell the member that I'm a facilitator, I'm not a sales rep. I'm giving notes, I'm putting all your stuff in your proposal. When they do the follow up, if you say you want to go ahead with the order, I'm giving you notes because I may not be the guy that comes back. I want to make sure you're taken care of. And they go, What do you mean? You're, you're my salesman. Well, no, I'm not. Anybody can do the job, it's a Costco program. It's just a matter of making sure you're happy. I haven't taken this, the, them away from the equation because most people don't want to go through the same process with another person. So that's value to somebody. It's like you've walked my house, you've done all these things. I want you to come back. I can't guarantee that. If they have me scheduled on the other side of town, they're not going to send me. They're going to send somebody else to facilitate the process because it's the company that's taking care of it. It's Costco that's taking care of it. If you go walk, I'm not doing anything but my job right here. See, so we're taking all that away from them. We're taking them totally out of the sales arena. It's not a sale at that point, but there are pressure points where you cause them pain by having to redo something, having to do it over. Because at this point, they've committed to a follow-up. They're thinking they might go forward. We're just trying to help them back into it by taking things away because, no, this is too easy. I know we've got along, we've talked about extra stuff, but I'm gonna make as good of notes as I can to make sure you're taken care of if I'm not available, because you will get taken care of. And you're going to be happy because you're a Costco member. You know, so you can utilize all those things. So, yes, the salesman gets put back on it. We don't send another salesman unless there's reasons why we can. Um, but for the most part, it either happens that there's uh, a new appointment set, or we set a new follow-up, or we set a no longer interested, and you flush them. So it's the same process over and over and over, and we'll reset those as long as they're going to reset. Because the one thing that happens, they build a rapport with our office staff, above and beyond the salesperson. And a lot of times, people won't ask their salesperson questions. They feel like they should have learned the first time, they're embarrassed to ask, but they'll ask that office staff all kinds of stuff. If they want more information, we send it. We don't care. you know. We don't care what they ask for, we're just going to send it. And our office people aren't scared to send them information on what the sales rep is. Well, if I send them that, I'm going to involve competition. You know, there's the fear factor. My salesmen don't call back because they don't like rejection. They're getting ready for another appointment, and they go, I'm not going to call that customer right now because I don't want the rejection before I go to the next appointment and have my day just like, well, that could be the customer that's going to say yes. And the only thing we do is piss them off by not calling them back when we're supposed to. So by the second day, he goes, I don't want to do business with you because you didn't do what you said and called me back yesterday. I've had people tell me that. When I was using the exact time, I called some this guy five minutes early one time. And he said, you're early. And I said, well, in five minutes, I got another appointment. I was calling you, so I don't want to call you late, so I called you early. He said, but that's not what you told me you were going to do. Because I get off work at 6.30. I said, call me at 7. I called at 5 to 7. And I said, so it's not okay that I called you at 5 to 7? He goes, no, because you told me 7 o'clock. And I'm like, really? 
And I was kidding with the guy, and he got more and more serious with it. And he finally said, well, I do want to move forward. I'm just disappointed you didn't do exactly what you said. And I'm concerned that you won't live up to any other promises. And I'm like, holy cow, sir. You know, but he wrote the order and he moved forward. So we talked about it after the fact. And he said, if you wouldn't have set a time, I wouldn't have cared if it was just any time that day. But you want to know exactly what time I was available. And you called early. And this was a test for me. He said, I would have, I made a long line the minute you said it. If you call me at 7, I'm in. If you don't, I'm out. So he was waiting for 7 o'clock at 5 minutes, just enough to just make me probably squirm is why he did that. But he was just that guy. But how many customers do we make a promise to and we don't fulfill it in the follow-up that we fail and we don't get their business? That's why we take it away from the salesman. Because the salesman will tell me, I don't, I don't, I hate the rejection. I put them off till all on Friday when I don't have appointments, and I call them all, regardless of what day it is. And I get that all the time. If they call back at all, because they'll tell me to call back and they never do. You know, they will lie to you. It's because they don't like it. They don't. They want to go see somebody new, fresh, fresh opportunity. That's a salesperson. Do you ever have the follow-up person? So this is someone in the office admin usually that uh -huh. is, is tasked with that yeah. specific job. Um, do they ask if they would like the same rep out? They usually say that they're going to attach the same rep. They okay. don't play that. They don't play it as hard as I have the salesman play it. Right. I could teach that over time, but my office staff isn't that good yet. That's something you build as well, your office staff, to learn how to go with that stuff. Yeah, um, and they can they can pick up on it on the conversation. Sure. If you know. Well, a, a lot of the way we handle that follow-up call is we do say we're following up for the salesperson. They're busy doing appointments today. We want to make sure that we've connected with you as we promised. So I'm calling ahead of time, early in the day, to see if you're going to be available at the time later in the day that I can put it in the schedule to remind him to call you at that time. So you make sure you make a connection. Okay, so he's not leaving you a message and you're calling back while he's on an appointment. And then while I'm on the phone, do you have any more questions for us? Is there anything else you need to place your order? Right. We're suggesting it all. Right. And most people will say, well, I'm going to place the order. I just have one more question. Right. And they can facilitate and get that question answered, call them back and say, why don't we get your installation scheduled? And then we'll schedule the paperwork, and I'll send Casey out to see you on this date. That's how we kind of handle it. We're looking just to get the information. It works every time, because the customer really doesn't need to talk to a salesperson. It's just that's who they think they have to talk to in that case. So they're dealing with the office, and if the office is good enough and they understand what they're doing, it goes very smoothly, because they're either going to schedule another follow-up, they're going to schedule another uh, an appointment to do paperwork and an installation if they can. A lot of people want to wait until they see the salesman to do the installation schedule, which is okay. But if we can get the installation scheduled and the appointment to go back out, it's perfect. Yeah. You know, because then we're locked in. Right. It's just a matter of, you know, facilitating the process. We look at everything as a process. Salesman's only portion is that three hour window of time that they go out and visit with a member and create a proposal. And then the office will pick it back up and resend them when necessary. And my salesmen don't even ask about their program. They don't even know if they get a cancellation. If we handle it in the office and at the last resort, we email them and say, this is canceled, if you can do anything with it. But we've already tried in the office. Right. Because that also, some of my salesmen don't even want to know because they don't want to deal with the negativity. Especially, because calling somebody back to cancel, <laughs> that's, that's we're brutal. Because they're going to tell you all the reasons why they're going to cancel. Then you're going to try to talk to the next person. And it does twist people's brains. Sure. So we try to take that out of it and just keep it positive. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is more of a question for Doyle and Chris regarding the presentation. For me personally, is there a way to incorporate the KCL in the presentation and the literature? Because in Florida, uh, municipal water and 99.5% of every Costco deal, it's KCL. And it's contradictory. 
to what the brochure says, and the unit itself has a program for KCL. So couldn't it say slash KCL or salt or? Well, I mean, are you talking about what, what where is it on the test? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's uh, the, the um, in Sarasota County, the, the where, and I don't want to get in the weeds. Yes, we can look at it, of course. Can I, where is it contradictory? Or Bob, would you have a comment? Well, I do because I forgot all about it, but about no one else is probably going to say BPA free on it, like mine does. And maybe that's what made you think about it. Yeah, like yeah, I, I was going to say, I don't that think that's Starburst, not on ours. I put that Starburst on there yeah, myself. You can customize. Well, I didn't, I didn't realize you could. I thought it was something that. Part of the thing. Where does it say the sodium versus KCF? Well, the problem is, is when we're doing a demo and we're using the brochure or the demo page, it never, nowhere does it talk about KCL. It's strictly salt. Uh, so, you know, when we're showing them that, the first question comes up, you know, is well, you said it doesn't use salt, you know, and all the brochures in the presentation talk about salt, salt, salt. Can we somehow just incorporate the KCL in that brochure? That's what? That's no salt? Just, just no, say, no, 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 salt. Option. say KCL is not salt. Say no, no. Potassium, you know, being a brine yeah. for yeah. the system. The way we present it is... Also works yeah. on yeah. potassium. Okay. Okay. Sure, we can right. modify it. Well, sure. Salt slash potassium. Right. Right. This basically, I think you can do that this yourself. This BPA free, you're not going to see on any on right. any of the presentations you yeah, have. It comes up a lot, Chris. I know you're saying... No, I get it. No, I'm not disagreeing. I'm not disagreeing at all. For your question for you. The BPA free is only because every now and then I had a customer say something about BPA free. I don't know enough about BPA free at that time <clears throat> to have an intellectual conversation about it, okay? But every pregnant woman in the world goes BPA free, I want that. So I only put the starburst there, so I didn't have to answer any questions. They'd say, it's BPA free, I want that. Does that make sense? So in your case, just take a starburst, put up there, works on potassium in a starburst, and you're never going to have to worry about that question. That's the nice thing about an electronic presentation, because when I get a situation where a customer stumping me, I just put a starburst, and the problem solved, because they see it, they recognize it, I don't talk about it, we move on, and they may bring it up later, but sometimes they just go, BPA free, I like that. That's awesome. And that's I didn't realize clue. we could do that with the brochure. Well, I did it in this case because I figured that's why I asked because the BPA free is not in the presentation. But I put it there because it's a problem for me. If anything's a problem for me, I try to put something in there, either in the verbs that I use for notes that they can read, that my sales person can read to answer the question. But if they read it, they don't answer the question. They don't ask the question. Right. Yeah, that, that's right. true. It's handled. And one thing about something that's in print, people believe a lot more than the words that come out of my mouth because it's a question. And that's where I run into the problem because I'm talking about KCL and then they see the word salt. So sure. that, that's what will help me. So in this case, I would just throw it up there. Potassium. Perfect. Built for potassium. Because it is. And we're a green company. And, and, and we're the, green. The sure. Costco customer <clears throat> is very green in my area. Well. And our product is, but it doesn't have everything in it that can possibly come up for every single region. Right. So this is a good example because that BPA free is only there for that one in 10 person that's gonna jump all over it, that if I tell it to all 10, it has no meaning to nine of them. And it's a waste of time for me. And it may ask a question, what is BPA free? If I bring it up. So I don't wanna talk about it because I don't have all technical stuff about it. So it's BPA free. It's not the softener, it's only the RO, from my understanding, is that correct? The, the RO is just, the RO is the only thing that's BPA free. It's certified BPA free. Right, but the water softener is not. It's just that our drinking water is coming from the RO, so just to clarify what's BPA free and what, you know, it's not like the monitor and everything else is BPA free, no, it's just the drinking water that we drink. Is the valve? I don't know who we've touched. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> find out BPA free. You, know, you have to say it was in the NSF one extraction, then we would have the data. I don't know if BPA is in the 61 extraction. Easy enough to find out. I'm just going to present this. Okay. It's a huge question. I mean, you guys aren't using that as a sales tool. BPA I mean, I mean, when you just took a take a look at how the federal government said that BPA is bad for for infants and young children. 
So why is it okay for an adult is the question. So it's a great thing to bring up to, I think, every single one of the customers is, this is what differentiates Eco Water from all the other ROs, is that they went through this extraordinary cost to send their product to NSF to show that it's BPA-free. It's very expensive to do that. So we highlight that in every... So many of our population, you know, they, they, you they, they do, love that. Not every one of the sales yeah. people, and most salesmen aren't even going to tune into what it is when they're being trained. It's just added rhetoric. Yeah. So when it's just there, it answers the question to the consumer that's going to ask the question, but it's not to the others, and it's already answered for the one that wants to know. Yeah. I see how you're doing it. It's smart. It, well, it is because what you said is, yeah, yeah. you believe it's yeah, really it's, important. It is, yeah. But it in takes this room, out of it. It's not gonna, I, everybody's not going to think done. the same thing. Right. It's a great but to idea. every consumer that thinks it's important, it is, but all of us aren't going to bring it up. Yeah. So that's part of, is that kind of subliminal answering a question? It is. It's bringing it up, it's answering it, it's over, and we don't have to talk about it. Okay? And that's really what I try to do. Any question that comes to me from a sales rep that I'm going to have to research, I'm going to try to add something like that that shows bring up the question, or this is how the question is answered. And those are just, usually I do them though in, in notes at the very bottom, I don't usually put them up on the top, so they're in a note form, because we can do that with the presentation, there's comment section, yeah. and some of them are hidden, and you can pop them up as pop-ups, you know, for a question from a consumer. But I believe in having every answer possible in the presentation where salesmen can access on that page. And as Dealing with a question, why should I answer it five times to five different reps, five more times because they're not going to remember the first five times, you just put it in the presentation in the notes section and they can refer to it in the home. They can just hit their notes section, pull it up and say, let's see if we have the answer, Mr. Customer. And if they have it in their notes, it has credibility on it, rather than them going, let me call my office or let me make something up. You know, so it's really about credibility and transparency that, no, this is the official answer that we have for this problem, and you have it right in your presentation, okay? Is the EPS 1000 the same, is it? I, I don't know, Ken, we'll look, we'll look this up when we get back to the office. Okay, I was just wondering, yeah. I didn't know. I don't know right now. I would assume so, but I wouldn't know the answer to that exactly, but I have to ask somebody, I guess Wilson probably. Okay, any other questions I can help you with? Okay, any feedback, how do you guys do it? I mean. I'd like to learn just as much from you guys because I haven't had no reps, I haven't had much exposure to anybody in the organization since I started this two years ago. It's consumed almost all of my time. I've missed football games. And other than boot camp last year, it was my really only exposure to the others in any one meeting place. So I haven't had a lot of feedback from other people. So compared to what we do, because I pretty much showed everybody what we do, um, what do you guys do? What do you do? We just got the program about two weeks ago, so... So I'm, it's all new I'm to you. Just learning, yeah. Did you learn anything today that might help you? Absolutely. How do you present the price? Like, when they... Is every sales guy a little bit well, different? Depending on what they're comfortable with? Kind of what I went over in our case, we would take this page here and we would punch in the 3500 the price would populate. We'd punch in the RO, the price would populate. We'd add an installation, and so that's your price. I can do it on my computer as, a, as an app, or I, but we do it typically on our cell phones because we don't always have internet to work with in the home, mm -hmm. but we always have it on our cell phones. So mm -hmm. our guys are pretty used to just doing it on the cell phone and run. Some of them have I, uh, tablets. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about tablets is you can run the presentation on one window, you can pop back and forth through the calculator on one screen. Um, you know, so about 50-50 in our case, we some have tablets, some are using their phones. But we don't run for price. We yeah. give it to them. There's always, you know, going to be sticker shock at times. You know, people are going to, you know, have an explosion. Yes. Yeah. Since you're asking for feedback, and I was uh, part of the other meeting, um, Brian from BD Trapman, uh, when they were talking about pricing, uh, he fe he finds it very beneficial to have structured. Uh, pricing across the board so that the salespeople don't have to reinvent the wheel running in the home. It's very structured the entire time and, and regulated based on the systems. It's one um, full, all-inclusive price, not necessarily separated out. It's the in, 
into installation pieces, but he did mention that depending on, uh, you know, I'm not the plumbing expert here, so he did mention Ours that. Ours would like that. Ours are all, can't, and I don't have it in this presentation because I didn't want to get into pricing right. discussion. Sure. Um, but this page has the price on it in our case. It's right across the bottom. So it shows the bundle price, as you will, and it'll say in there plus installation. And our installations are 250 and up, sure. depending on the plumbing work. They could go much higher depending if it's a lot of plumbing. But it, it states it right on the bottom. So when I hit this page, I'm not talking about price. They're seeing the price. Now it doesn't include their, their, their Costco card. It doesn't include executive. So that's something we're going to talk about while they're watching the price and they're listening to what I'm telling them about the unit. I'm talking about the unit. They're staring at the price, trust me. <laughs> their, their, their mind is, they're not listening to anything I'm saying up here because they're staring right there at the price. I mean, you can see it in their eyes. You can read what they want to ask you. There's no mystery. And they go, is that the Costco price? Is that, you get all kinds of questions. Sometimes you get nothing and you just move to the next page. I don't tell them the price, they just see the price, just like if they're in a store, they see the price. So I go to the next page, which in this case would be, um, I'm gonna go right to, we're gonna bypass the price because they just saw it, and I'm gonna go to, um, uh, that's what we go over what's covered in warranty, right up front, that worksheet, and I gotta get to, these pages are a little bit out of order. So we go right to the Costco card, and we talk about the 10% discount. They've seen the price. Now we talk about the benefits and the value of buying through Costco. You've seen the price. Now we're going to get 10% up to 13% back if you're an executive member. Um, okay. So now you can get up to 13% back. I love people's maths because they come up with all kinds of different numbers what that number could be. Sometimes it's really, really high and I don't say much. Sometimes it's really, really low and I help them out. But they're going to see that eventually anyway. So they're starting to go, oh, that's not that bad now. Because they've done the math and it's like, I'm getting all these discounts, so it's not this price, it's going to be this price. So you're hitting it with state shock and you're taking it away now with the value. So this to me is um, a value. I don't talk about what the price is of the Perfect 10. This is on the one that I received originally from Costco, or from, from Eco Water with the price of $399. It's a value, $399. This is what you get. Costco members receive this. Special. Makes you a perfect 10 warranty. And then you've got your, in our case, refiners or lifetime warranty on the tank and the resident medium. So it's great. You get a media lifetime, you get your tanks, the working components, and then you get the added benefit of a full perfect 10 warranty on the rest of your major components. So you got an excellent warranty back to your product. And you've already blown up the media in your presentation, right? Absolutely. That's what's awesome about it. Well, that. in this case, too, then it comes up your competition. In our case, it's Kinetico a lot right. of times. Right. Or Culligan or whatever. And we talk about the carbon. Because it simply states in the warranty, there is no maintenance on our carbon. Uh, it's a lifetime warranty. And a warranty is your product that's going to filter chlorine taste and odor for the lifetime of the original owner. So. You can have this product or you can buy another product that you're going to change the carbon out every three years for 300, 400, 500, depending on what product you have, which will save you in 10 years. You're going to save that at least two to three times. And that's a real value over other products. So I do add that into my presentation at that point. But it's all built in earlier right. when I talk about the resin. Right. I'm really setting the stage for closing the whole time I'm working there. I'm working on what I'm going to say at the end with the tools that I have through the program. Okay, so that those three pages I go, and I've never talked about price. They've only seen the price, and that's when we use our calculator. By the way, we're going to do a proposal because our purpose to be there, and it starts at the lead wrap. We're not going to sell you anything. We're coming out to deliver you a proposal. On the wall, on the brochure, it says you're going to arrange for an appointment. A specialist is going to come out, test your water, give you options and solutions on how to treat your water. We're going to leave you with a proposal, and when you're ready, you're going to schedule an installation. It's a four-step process, and that's how we design the, our presentation for. So when we get this, we go into, into proposal mode. 
And if we're going to do a proposal, we need to follow it. If we're not going to do a proposal, we just need you're not interested in our product. And once you've committed to a follow-up and a proposal, what's stopping us from taking an order? What can we do? Hey, Bob, you said on the wall. Is that something that you guys have wrapped? No, it's on your on the kiosk. It's written four steps in the kiosk program. It's on the it, inside it's on the board. Panel. But it's all if you open if you get one of the brochures that the customer takes home, that process is also in there. Okay. And I suggest you know that because that's the only thing the customer knows about you. They're reading it and that's what they're expecting you to do. And if you don't know what it is, you're at a disadvantage with the member. History tells me anyway. Because some of them read it verbatim what they expect you to do. So if you don't test the water, they can, they'll hold you accountable because it says it in the brochure you're going to. If you don't give them a proposal, they will hold it against you because it says in the proposal you're going to give them one. You know, so that's the way we look at it. Okay. So, I know what you do. Do you, you present like good, better, best, right? We do. And have we, you, we do show the good. Have you done like an app part? You said you use an app. Like we, we found success in putting together an, more or less well, an app that we someone a, can go we through. Have a, we have a slide for it do you? that pops in right after the. We do show the refiner with the price that we're proposing most of the time mm -hmm. for a talking point. The next slide actually is good, better, best. Yeah. So it does introduce that. Um, I say that it's the next slide. It's really not. It's the slide after this one. Because we go through the presentation based on that one, and then if there's any question, we roll right <coughs> to good, better, best as options. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, we're going to talk them out of option A. We're going to talk about option B and, and C as the two main options. You know, um, really in our case, we don't have any value in selling the first option because there's no money in it. And it's not really what the consumer needs. And I, I tell them every time, if you're going to buy that, please buy it from my competition because it won't, I, I'm not going to take care of you in my market with that product. Right. You're, you need this product because of the high corn content in our case. So we're eliminating that. And I've never had anybody buy it from me. I've had some reps sell it, but then we teach them how not to sell it. Yeah. You know, because we're not doing a service by selling them a product that they can go to Home Depot and buy. No, but I think it's important for a lot of the people to understand that you can say, sure. I can do that, however, this is what we do. We we had like a 10% jump when we went in our overall sales when the sales team started actually giving an app and let the customer play with it while they present and talk. Because sure. they go right, like you said, to the price, and then they're playing with an app. And they, when you get the customer's actual physical interaction, they feel, feel like they're in control versus being sold. We sort of thought. I wouldn't like that. I don't have any like that right now. Oh yeah. So it's, I can only show them. But it's a great idea to step them. I can do that, but this is why we want them. See, we get the interaction when we go up to the sink if we're on our a laptop or an iPad. We put it there and have the member fill in the hardness number, fill yeah. in the TDS number for us for that same kind of interaction yeah. with it. Yeah. But that's all about just getting them involved yeah. in the presentation. So that's not to lose interest by the husband and the wife. So whoever's losing interest, we have them help us by filling <laughs> the blanks. That's a great you thing. Know, those are just little you know, yeah. things that we do and we learn to do. Get the kids to shake the soap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So how do you do your presentation? Well, we, we, we do exactly this. We use exactly the same PowerPoint, but then we hand the customer the app, which has their name. It's already pre-populated from Salesforce in there. So they literally see it all. And we have them enter their hardness and whatever's wrong with the water. And then we say the presentation sideways. Now they can choose the product category that's most interesting to them. So we have half of our clients are well water. So it's very complicated. We had to figure out how do we make it more simple. So now we've broken it into three categories. And each category has basically three options. So they choose the option. They can see the the products and while we're talking so about getting, it, they're, they can they're play. getting confidence because it's there in front of them. Yeah, and they get to have control over it and they then they start stopping you in the in the presentation saying, Well why is this one the best? And you know, we highlight with little icons why it's all the best. In our market, radium is huge and this is the only company that has an EPA cert that says, you know, it takes out radium two two eight and two two six. 
it's worth investigating, you guys, because you just go to the New York Times Toxic Water Study, and, and you can look at every single community across the country and see what the city's violations were. So in my communities, radium is the big one, and this organization has one of the, in my opinion, the best products because it's EPA certified. But, the, you know, the, that little icon is with a radium, you know, icon is on there, and people go, what is that? And then they start understanding why that's the best product. So it creates that value, I guess you could say. But I'll tell you, when people feel like they're in control by being able to press that silly button, um, you know, they love it. Well, it gets them to pay attention and focus, too. Yeah. You're yeah. Just telling and it's interactive. Story. Yep. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And that app was Salesforce? No, we had them this custom built. So, but it, it sits on the Salesforce platform. Okay. So Salesforce is a very, it's a very programmable software. You know, it's a CRM, but you actually have to get someone that you know programs it for okay. you. Okay. We need to wrap up. Is there any other, anything else that you know that anybody wants to throw in there? Thank you. Outstanding. Good job, Bob. Outstanding. Great job. Nice work.